this was my go-to product for a long time. It was the first place I tested. I absolutely loved it. And then the FDA came in and took away half of the benefit. 23andMe then came in and redesigned their entire interface. So like my friend Gail is here tonight because she did 23andMe a long time ago. And if you did that, it's all been changed since the first time. And it's a little bit more difficult to navigate. One of the things that really bothers me is it's almost impossible for me to make slides from their little tiny gray print that you can see. But I'm going to do the best I can, and if we manage to get it up online, you'll be able to see it from home. This is one, one part of the home page you get when you bring up 23andMe. They have three reports on ancestry, seven on wellness, and 19 on traits. And we're going to go through what those look like. They also have some medical reports that we'll get to a little bit later. OK, this is what mine looks like. It's a little bit different for everybody, especially if you were on the old 23andMe. So for instance, you see this here where it says reports archive? All my old medical reports we were able to get before the FDA said no, they're stored there. And I'm really glad I can have them. On the other hand, when they updated this, if you didn't pay for another test, they didn't give you the new version. Now, personally, I'd rather have the old version. But the thing is, I can't make slides to show you what it looks like now because I don't have the new version. In addition to the kinds of things they report on the top, they have some functions like share and compare, DNA relatives, and the research. You should be aware that if you, and it's Ancestry too, I believe, if you buy a test through Ancestry, they're going to give you the chance to opt in to their research. Now, 80% of their customers have. Why would you want to do that? Well, I want to do it because I've had some terrible things I've had to deal with diseases over my lifetime, and they were doing research on one of them. So you can bet I wanted to find a cure. I wanted to contribute. If everybody that says they have this is contributing their DNA, then maybe they can get discoveries faster. I know Michael J. Fox, for instance, who had Parkinson's disease, gave them a huge grant to pull out people that had Parkinson's disease and see what they could figure out in relation to that. But make no mistake about it, they don't make any mistake about you knowing that one of their main purposes is medical. In fact, they take your name out of it for us because you're part of a study. Say I've been part of an asthma study because I had really bad asthma as a kid. Everything they're studying, you get to opt in. As I said, my daughter is a genetic counselor. And I passed on to her something I have called Factor V Leiden that makes you more likely to develop a blood clot. And she's got it. Yes. I've got one. Oh, you poor person. You need to talk to a genetic counselor. OK, so you're treated for it. OK, oh, yes. See, that's what, you're, that's what you're likely to get. And I had a small pulmonary embolism myself during the summer, and so right now I'm on blood thinners, and I hate it. So if you have one copy, as you pointed out, that gives you a higher chance than the general population, but it's not real significant. You have two copies, it can be life-threatening for DVTs and things like that. So it says here that I've participated in research and um, help with 41 insights they've had. I wanted to do that, but that's your option. We're here mainly to talk about the ancestry part, and so that's what we're going to do tonight. The ancestry reports, there's three different kinds. They have one called ancestry composition, one that talks about your haplogroup, if you're male or female, and one that talks about your Neanderthal ancestry. If you're like white European, you usually have some. And that's just sort of for fun. Then 
there's another part called DNA relatives. And that's, what I, that's one of the things I really want to talk to you about because they want you to do open sharing, although last week they made it a little easier. I'll tell you what that means. Ancestry composition. To take full advantage of what they have to offer, you have to do the following. Go to tools, go to tools. From the drop-down menu, click on DNA relatives. Update your DNA profile, which I'll show you what that looks like on the next slide, and choose open sharing. Well, what that means is they will be able to share their insights about who you're related to with anybody else that's clicked open sharing. If they haven't clicked open sharing, it's a really big pain because you have to go through every one of them and invite them to share. Once again, I know you can't see this, and it just kills me, but if I bring up DNA relatives, that button there, there's a people and DNA. But on the right-hand side in print, you can hardly see, but I highlighted it, it says update DNA relatives profile. And what they want you to do is underneath that, you get a screen that comes up and says open sharing. And they'll tell you what kinds of things you can get. And it says, yes, I want to open share. Believe me, if you're using this company, you want to open share. Because otherwise, what's the point? When, when we get to talking about ethnicity and why it does or doesn't work or how much of it you can believe, they tell you right here, here's mine, it is so daggone boring. I'm 99% seven European, percentage European, they figure, with a three-tenths of a percent Middle Eastern and North African, and a tenth of a per percent unassigned. But here's the key. You really need to do this. It says, see all 31 tested populations. Because maybe you're from a population that's not even tested or they don't have a reference group for it. So you look and up comes something like this. So here's their 31 populations and I can see that they think, and you know, I'm gonna say this over and over and over again, none of these companies can distinguish between French and German. So if you're expecting to get German, you're not. Now, in 23andMe, they will call it French and German. In Ancestry, they call it West European, I believe, right? Do we know what they do for FTDNA? I can't remember. But not one of the companies is gonna say German. And people from this region get really upset about that. Yes, so they say I'm 65% British and Irish, 11.5 French and German, Scandinavian. You've got, if you see ethnicity talk on the counter, you've got to come because you will not believe how different it is from company to company. So you can see I'm basically a blank slate, not very exciting at all. Yes. Okay, well, look at this. You can't possibly see it, but they will tell you. This is our reference population, like what we're basing our results on. So the top one says East Asian and Native American, then European, then Middle Eastern and North Africa, Oceanian, South Asian, Sub-Saharan Africa. And if you look in there, it'll give you a list of what countries could fall into that broad category. Because it's not like they have, in, a, in most cases, an Italian population, a Greek population, a Spanish population. They don't. Because in Europe, there's too much admixture. There was too much moving. And this science gets better and better every year and more and more refined every year. But we aren't there yet. When Pam and I took the course this summer, C.C. Moore was giving a talk on this issue, 
And she was saying, look at this. And this company, Greek, is thrown in with this. And this company is thrown in with this. It'd be like Greek and Italian in one case and Greek and, you know, so you've got to know, based on your testing company, what they're basing it on. It just says ancestry comp. Oh, just exactly what I put in red. Okay. And I'm sure you could probably search on it and find it, and maybe you'll tell us, Gail, where to find that. But that's critical. Now, this is one of the things that 23andMe does now that they did not do before that people really like. I'm talking about the pros here. They give you an estimate because too many times we look at these results and we think they're legit. And it's not that they're not legit, they are based on science, but 23andMe has this wonderful little slider. So on the far right, it says speculative. That means the results we give you under speculative, we're 50% sure they're right. Then you could look at the same results for 60, 70, 80, 90, which is conservative. And those are the ones, you know, we're really sure of these based on our data. So let me show you what that's going to look like. This is how it's set, unless you reset it. This is me at the speculative estimate, which is 50%. And you can see they've got my populations listed there. Good luck reading them. But you can see a whole bunch of various shades of blue. And they're pretty sure, based on their reference populations, that this is what I am. OK, now watch what happens when I move the slider. Let's try 90%, the opposite end of the scale. Look at that. Those are the same results. I'll go back. See all this blue? See all this? Much, much less. And so that's their conservative estimate. By God, they're pretty sure of my X and parts of my 20th chromosome and my first and second, you can see. But the rest of it, the science is not as sure. And you can do 60%, 70%. Um, as you get more and more conservative, your graph's going to look different. And that, to me, is more honest than anything any company does in terms of ethnicity, because they say, it is this range. This is the state of the science now. This is what we think. I pulled it into a table so you could at least have some chance of seeing it. Notice that speculative, I'm 99.7% European in both the speculative and the conservative. Going down to the next one, British and Irish, look at this. At the speculative level, they think I'm 65% British and Irish. Move it over to 90% confidence, and now it's down to 10.3. What a difference. French and German. In the speculative range, they think I'm 11.5% German, not even at all listed in the conservative one. And the truth of the matter is, I know I'm about 11.5% German. My great-grandfather, who did not die until I was 10, came from Germany. You know, I know that whole side of the family. So at least they're honest about how confident they are in what they're telling you. The more specific you try to get, the more speculative the guess. Greater specificity equals greater speculation. This tool just came out about two weeks ago. And you should have seen the groups that I follow burning up on this. Most reactions were negative, I will tell you. Other people are going, no, that follows my family perfectly. What they did with this. They really did base it on science. They have an entire white paper, which of course none of us wants to read, that explains exactly what they did. These are PhD people in population genetics. They do know a few things. So what this attempts to do is look at where your most recent ancestor that fit one of these profiles came into your tree. So looking at this, my most recent one would be British and Irish. Now, I'm going to tell you, 
I have a whole bunch of British, way more than I ever thought I did. I used to think they're just so crazy. And then I got all the way back to my colonial ancestors, and they're an endogamous population. You know, they married each other. They were in these little communities in the 1600s. That piled up the common DNA, and they were all from England, every one of them. My grandmother is Irish. I have a couple great-grandmothers that are Irish. So that is definitely true. Then I look at Fr French and German. They have that coming into my life around 1830. Well, I happen to know that German line back to the 1600s. They estimate the most recent one to enter my line was 1830. Well, that's pretty close to right. Scandinavian, every one of these companies has a problem with Scandinavian. I mean, they call it the Scandinavian problem. So I always, well, I'm not from Scandinavia. Finnish, I've never seen that before. Italian, I've not seen. Ashkenazi Jew and North African. So I put it up there so that you can play with it and look at it and you can even get online and watch everybody fight. They either love it or hate it. Because I wanted to get a little color in here, this may be my um, grandson. If you notice, they put him at 99.1% European, and then underneath that, they broke back down into French and German, British and Irish, Scandinavian, broadly Northwestern Europe. So those are the categories they put him in. This is a feature I absolutely love, but you have to have a couple generations in there to do it. And I'm lucky enough to have that. So RH happens to be my lovely ex-husband. And that's me on the right there. And LV is my daughter. Well, you can see that I married a very genetically similar husband because we're both 49.8 and 49.9 European, hardly any differentiation at all. One half is what my daughter got from me, the other half is what she got from him. Very boring. We're boring, I'll tell you. So then I put my grandson in there, because I knew he had at least a little Eastern European. So on the right-hand side is what he got from my daughter, and on the left-hand side is what he got from his father. And now we're seeing a little bit of what they're calling East Asian, South Asian, whatever. Not real significant. But a few more colors. All right, so now we're going to go to this next part. Compare your DNA to see what segments you share with close and distant family. In this part here, but these are some of my DNA relatives. DNA relatives, just like on FTDNA when Pam was talking, there's a drop-down menu. And so you can organize them by the strength of the relationship, the percentage of the relationship, the seg number of segments shared. Yeah, newest relatives. So Sometimes you don't want to go through the whole list, and it's like, who's been on since whatever? And so then all that information is at the right, and there's also some color coding there, like the ones with the blue, they're sharing with me. The ones that are in purple, that's open sharing, even better, because they didn't have that in the old system. And then not sharing. So you. If they're not sharing and you want to share because you think they're a relative, you have to write to them through their system. You can search on DNA relatives and compare them to selected individuals. So this is one of these where I set up the top ones, my grandson, followed by his father, followed by his daughter, followed by me, followed by his grandfather. And then you get these wonderful graphs. Isn't that pretty? The first one is my grandson compared to his father. And you can see, since you get one chromosome from mom and one from dad, all the way across it's that purple. The next one is what he shares with his mother. 
and this is a chromosome by chromosome. I only put the first five up here, but they do it for every chromosome, all the way across. Then you look at what he shares with me, and you can see on the first chromosome, I'm that sort of pink color, and then there's an orange segment that's below it. So part of that's me, and part of that's my ex-husband. So I can see what parts he got from each of us. And you can do that on all the chromosomes they have. And you can do it with everybody in your DNA relatives. You can just pick different people you want to see. I love some of the graphics on 23andMe. They gave me my maternal haplogroup. They said H. Now, when I did it with FPDNA, where they searched the whole thing, they said H27. So the overall haplogroup didn't change, but it got more refined. They couldn't do the paternal one because I'm not male. Here's the Neanderthal one, just for fun. I'm more like the caveman than, what's it say, 94%? This is more than 94% of 23andMe customers. All of us have little percentages overall. I have 315 Neanderthal variants. It's not a lot, but apparently I inherited more Neanderthal than a lot of other people in their population. Tutorials. You can click on tutorials, and let's say it's like, oh, I know she said you could do something with DNA relatives, or where's this, or where that. You can click on the tutorials. They also have a form. They have your raw data that you can download, share and compare, family trees, all that kind of stuff. Some of these features are all in tutorials. They're usually five or six slides, and they'll explain that specifically. Okay, now here's some of the medical stuff, and I know you can't read it well, and I'm sorry, but they give you 35 carrier status reports, and I'm going to talk to you about that in a minute. That includes, like, cystic fibrosis. In fact, since you have Factor V Leiden, I can tell you that almost every one of my siblings tested on 23andMe back in the day when you could get your medical reports, because for $99 they could tell if they were heterozygous or homozygous, factor V Leiden. But it was sure a lot cheaper than going through a medical lab for the same thing. So some of those reports include things like cystic fibrosis, sickle cell, anemia, hereditary hearing loss, things like that. Then they have what they call five wellness reports. They're like, do you tend to be a deep sleeper? Do you have lactose intolerance? It might say something about saturated fat and weight gain. And then they have the fun ones that Judy Russell, I think, would say are like tea party conversation. The traits, they have 19 of them. Like male pattern baldness, sweet versus salty, whether or not you might have a unibrow. Now, do they tell you the exact percentage? No. I'll show you what these reports look like. As I said, I can't look at the reports that most people get now because I tested before when we get all kinds of medical conditions, and that's gone. So if you're a longtime user of 23andMe, you, you got them, and they archived them for you. New users can't get them. They only report now on 35 health conditions, all of which have been prove, approved by the FDA. Now here's cystic fibrosis. This is an example of a report. I don't even know who this is. Th this is one of their sample reports. Zero variants detected on the CFTR gene. Now, I know when I first did 23andMe, that's exactly what I got. My daughter did it. She had one variant. We tested her dad. Guess who she got the variant from? He had one. She's like, oh, man, that, that sort of scares me. What if you had it and he had it and I got two copies? Yeah, that's a problem. Wellness. So they come up with little things like, I'm likely lactose tolerant. I'm likely to weigh more on a high saturated fat diet. No kidding. 
I'm unlikely to flush with, with all the Irish I have, it surprises me. Likely consumes more caffeine, absolutely true. Muscle composition, likely a sprinter, no. Sleep movement, likely more movement during sleep, definitely true. But notice it says likely. This isn't something you absolutely know. Then they have other things like taste and smell. They've got three, you can click on three reports about that. Facial features, hair, physical characteristics, physical responses, and skin. So let me show you what one of those looks like. Your hair. So you can click here, so then you click on it and they give you the percentages. Then the texture of your hair, whether it's curly, straight, blah, blah, blah. Age related, newborn hair amount. Like I know my daughter didn't get it, have a head of hair until she was over a year old. So then you click on those, and I didn't click on those because I decided to go to this one. This is eye color. So this is the kind of thing they'll give you in a report like that. It says, my genetic likelihood of having blue or green or lighter eyes is 98%. They predicted that compared to other people in their population with the genes I have, well, 68% of their European ancestry customers had lighter eyes, and then they break it down into blue, 30%, green, 13, greenish blue, green, 13, and light hazel, 12. Darker eyes, 32%. So you can see that they haven't taken my genome and said, oh, she's blue-eyed. They give you a range. And in my family, I'm one of those interesting, I think it's interesting, my mom and dad have brown eyes. And blue's recessive. And I have blue eyes, their firstborn child. Well, both their mothers had blue eyes. So 25% of my DNA comes from my grandmother, 25 from one, 25 from the other. Two recessive genes got together, I have blue eyes. From a genetic point of view, there should have been a one in four chance I would have had blue eyes. I'm the oldest of seven. First has blue, last has blue, everybody else brown. We almost fit the model. My mom and dad just need to have another kid to prove it. 